Today, the Fed releases minutes of its April 27th policy meeting, a meeting that St. Louis Fed President Jim Bowler has called a robust discussion about what the central bank should do next. For more on just how robust and how he sees the economy, James Bullard is here for a Bloomberg exclusive. He is with economics editor Mike McKee. Mike, take it away. Well, Betty, there are 12 Federal Reserve districts, and Jim Bullard's the eighth. He is right in the middle of the country, seven states, smack in the heartland, which gives him a very close-up view of what's going on in all sectors of the economy. We're pleased to welcome President Bullard to In the Loop. And uh, over the past year, you're sort of a hawk who's nested with the doves. So where <laughs> are you now after uh, all your soundings of the economy? And where is that in relation to the rest of the Fed? Uh well, I think we're in. Uh, I think we're in fairly good position right now with the uh, QE2 program coming to an end here. I think the Fed's in a good position to go on pause, uh, collect more data about the economy, see how things develop uh, going forward. Uh, first quarter was a bit weaker than would probably has been widely reported, but uh, but I do think that the rest of the year will be fairly strong, 3 to 4 percent growth, and, uh, and that we'll uh, uh, have a good rest of the year. But we'd like to see some data on that. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, been a little weak lately. Yeah, it's been a little softer, although the jobs report, I thought, was uh, reasonably good. Uh, you know, three quarters of a million jobs in the last three months, that's not too bad. And, and uh, uh, so I'm, and I'm pretty optimistic that the hiring will continue uh, through this year, at least uh, by the contacts that I talk to. You've got a lot of lean firms. They've already cut everything they can cut. They've got a lot of cash. They're looking for opportunities. That sounds like a recipe for jobs growth. Now, you say the Fed's on pause. Can you define pause? Uh, you've said in the past that it would be reasonable to expect some sort of policy tightening by the end of the year. Do you still feel that way? Uh, I think I still think it's reasonable. Pause, I think we have to be very careful here because it's not just the Fed funds rate anymore. So it's uh, it means that the balance sheet stays where it is, it means that the policy rate uh, stays where it is, and it means that the language stays where it is, uh, the extended period language. So all those things just go freeze for a while, mm -hmm. and then uh, in, the, in the future meetings uh, through the summer and fall, then the committee can gather more information and decide what to do next. So uh, that's a natural way for the committee to proceed. I'm not, you know, I'm just one member, but, but that's a natural way to proceed. Well, are you concerned about inflation at this point? Most Americans are. Uh, some of the inflation numbers have been higher, and, uh, and it does concern me. I do think expected inflation has drifted back down on the tips market in the last uh, couple of weeks here. Five-year tips inflation is right around 2%. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that from the Fed's point of view. So I do think it's reasonable to think that some of our headline numbers will, uh, will ratchet back here uh, going forward. Well, we have, I think, we'll keep a close eye I, on that. I think we'll we can show that. Eye. The 10-year yield has dropped significantly along with the Fed's own measure of inflation expectations since about April 1st. Both are down. Uh, market reading it correctly at this point. No inflation problem and no tightening on the horizon? Uh, well, the, no inflation problem. I would want to keep a close eye on that. Uh, if the economy starts to improve in the second half of the year, and I think it's reasonable that it might, then, then we have to uh, keep an eye on that and, and watch that closely. And the expected inflation will bounce back up if that's what happens. But right now we're at a stage where the first quarter was a little weaker than we thought. Uh, now, and I still think it'll be strong in the second quarter and going on, but we need to get some data to, to show us that. So now is a good time to wait for more data to come in on the economy, I think. Well, let's ask directly <laughs> to Jim Bowler, how far apart are presidents, or are the governors and the presidents within the Fed? Well, I think there's a healthy debate, and I think that that's, uh, that's a good thing. You want to observe that. What you'd worry about the committee is everyone is absolutely in lockstep and there no debate is going on. That's a, that's a recipe for groupthink, and the whole thing could uh, fall apart. So I, th I actually think the debate's very, very well, what's helpful. What's the biggest source of disagreement right now? Well, uh, this is a complicated exit for the Federal Reserve. So in normal times, it's, it's always controversial. It's one of the most controversial things a central bank does. But uh, in normal times, you would just say, okay, we're going to raise the funds rate a quarter, you know, basis or a quarter or 25 basis points, and that would be it. But here you've got a lot of moving pieces. You've got a balance sheet policy. You've got this language in the statement, extended period, and you've got the policy rate at, uh, at zero, unprecedented. So you've got a lot of moving pieces. Maybe there's multiple ways, that, different ways that you could do it. We'd all get the same results. 
Maybe well, there's an optimal way to do it. You know, so I think that's where the that's where the debate is. We're all we're all working on that, and I think uh, both at the Fed and in financial markets, trying to understand that. One of your colleagues, Jeffrey Lacker of the Richmond Fed, said that talking about an exit is an exit. So is that what we're going to see first? The Fed change its language. Uh, well, I think we've seen some of that. I think, yeah. in some sense, uh, the end of the QE2 program is is sort of the high tide of the of uh, the easy monetary policy. Uh, I think it's very natural for the committee to go on hold in a situation like this, get more information about the economy, and then uh, make a decision about what to do next. Uh, we do have a very, at least in absolute terms, it's a very easy monetary policy. Uh, not just zero rates on, coming up on two, you know, we're at two and a half years here on zero rates and, and plus this uh, very large balance sheet. You know, it seems like you could get a lot of inflation out of that if you don't handle it correctly. And so, uh, so that's where we are. Well, talking about inflation, I mean, is there a divide within the Fed about whether or not commodity prices are driving inflation? Uh, I think it's a it's a big issue inside the Fed to think should we think mostly in terms of core inflation or mostly in terms of headline inflation. I'm actually going to give a speech tonight on this very topic. I think uh, I think we should mostly pay attention to headline inflation. Um, that's the inflation measure. Uh, that's the best inflation measure that we have. Um, and you know. I think you can get into a trap by uh, overemphasizing uh, core inflation, and then you sort of get lulled into thinking that these other prices don't matter, but they do matter uh, for the economy, and they do. These are the prices people are actually paying. Plug headline inflation into a Taylor rule, and you get a rate increase right now. <clears throat> Yeah, I think if you're going to use headline inflation, then you have to be careful to modify your rules so that you handle the fact that, you know, if you use headline inflation, it's going to, it's going to go like this. And if you use core inflation, it goes like this. Mm -hmm. so, so if you're going to use headline inflation, which I think is fine, then you have to sort of recalibrate what your rule looks like. But some of the economists, and we're actually going to have one on later on the program, John Riding, has, has you know, continued to say, and I've heard this echoed before, that, um, you know, when the Fed implemented QE2, um, and, and started to, you know, and put more stimulus into the economy, that's when we really saw commodities rise and we really saw the rally. So, you know, he likes to say that, you know, the Fed takes credit for the equity rally, but it doesn't take credit for the commodity boom. Yeah. What do you say to that? Well, I think uh, commodities are vexing. Uh, you've got uh, global supply and demand factors, uh, which are surely very important uh, for, for commodities. So I don't think it can, you can just pin it on the Fed that the Fed just said, okay, let's have higher commodity prices. It's not like that. But, um, uh, you know, to really understand uh, global commodity markets in the modern era is the for foremost challenge for monetary policy in the, in the current situation. Let me ask you uh, about the end of QE2. Bill Gross has said when the Fed stops buying, he's not sure there's somebody who's going to step in, and he's worried about what happens to the Treasury market. Do you share that concern, or is he wrong? Well, uh, you might remember that we purchased a lot of uh, mortgage-backed securities, and, uh, and when the mortgage-backed security purchases were going to end, people said that uh, those, uh, that was going to affect the market a lot. That didn't really materialize, and I think you're going to see the same thing here. Uh, you know, Markets kind of have rational expectations. They understand uh, that the Fed's going to pull out of this market. I think there's plenty of buyers. So you're confident that there's private capital to take up? I think so, yeah. Also, if you look ahead at, uh, at uh, sort of futures prices out there, you don't see any, any jump at the, at the time that we're expected to leave the market. I want to re return back to um, when one of the questions Mike had for you early on, which was about monetary policy. And, and you know, I think it had been in your last speech, you had said it, you know, it would be on hold, and you're going to have meetings, obviously, to talk more about yeah. that. How much longer on hold, though, before we start to see some tightening? Will it be by the end of this year? Well, I think that's the, the, you know, that's what the committee is there to decide, and, and I do think we'd like to get more data on the economy at this juncture. Uh, if, if the first quarter had come in, you know, gangbusters at 5% growth and, and jobs had, you know, come in very strong and we'd had other indicators, then I think you'd be in more of a hurry. But uh, it came in a little softer than expected, and so the data all through the first half here has been a bit softer than expected, although the jobs report, like I said, 700 50,000 or so jobs in the last three months. It's reasonable. Mm -hmm. Private sector. Uh, so, um, so I think uh, you'd like to get more data at this point. And also, I think inflation expectations uh, measured on the tips market, you know, they're not running away from you. So, uh, so I like to look at tips expectations of inflation, not the survey measures. I think the survey measures are too sluggish and they're very sensitive to uh, gas prices. So 
I think it's better to look at the at sort of the market base that gives you sort of a daily read on uh, what mm -hmm. markets are thinking about inflation. Just a minute left. What would you do first, asset purchases or raise interest rates? I like a balance sheet uh, first policy, and I think the Fed will take a balance sheet first policy because that reinvestment uh, will continue reinvestment when we're on pause. But probably the first thing that we would do is uh, let some of the uh, runoff occur on the balance sheet, and so that, in some sense, that is a balance sheet first uh, policy. Uh, I'd also I'd be more aggressive about managing the balance sheet down maybe than some of the other members. Uh, so I don't know where that stands, but I, I, w I would be more aggressive about that. But I do think we're going to start with the balance sheet in the sense that we'll uh, probably the first thing we would do is uh, is let the runoff occur. So we see that in the minutes today. Um, is, was uh, that I can't I, I can't comment on the minutes before they're out. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. Yeah. <laughs> on that note, thank you very much.